Good morning. Uh, it's my pleasure to introduce Dr. Michael Jensen, who's a good friend of many of, our, of, many of us in Minnesota. Mike got his BS at Tufts, his MD at UPenn, and he did an internship and residency at uh, Children's Hospital of Oakland. Uh, then did a fellowship in pediatric hem hematology oncology at University of Washington and Fred Hutch with Phil Greenberg at, in the lab. He then was recruited to City of Hope where he became an assistant director of the pediatric neuro-oncology program and advanced to associate chairman of the Department of Cancer Therapeutics and Tumor Immunology. He's the Senegal Endowed Professor there, director of the Ben Town Center, which is a really spectacular center focused on uh, childhood cancer research. And he's co-head of a consortium uh, of immunology and vaccine development and has started uh, CureWorks, which is a very interesting concept that you might, or might be talking about, I'm not sure, uh, for some national studies and CAR T-cell trials. Uh, Mike's been heavily supported with American Association for Cancer Research Fellowship, Young Investigator Award, Ernest McCullough and James Till Award from ASBMT, Stop Cancer Research Career Development and Advancement Awards, Young Investigator Award from the Society of Pediatric Research and Pediatric Cancer Research Foundation, Physician Scientist. He's PI or co-PI of UO1s, P30, uh, several RO1s, Stand Up to Cancer, and Juno Therapeutics where he is a, a co-founder. So, Mike started in Phil Greenberg's lab and uh, worked on molecular targets. And his first CAR T cell work was on CD20. Uh, and he's then gone on to do multiplexing, uh, making T cell clones that were specific for CD19, treating different diseases, uh, which he's extensively published, with some interest, uh, some significant interest in glioblastoma and other brain tumors. Uh, and he's looked at neuroblastoma and uh, studied in vivo trafficking. We've collaborated with him on uh, looking at gene editing projects and a CAR T cell project that's ongoing. Uh, Mike is really a luminary in the field. He has, he's one of the true uh, founders of this uh, cellular therapy, and um, there isn't a nicer guy around. So uh, it's a pleasure to welcome Mike to give his talk on enhancing synthetic IQ of CAR T cells. Well, good morning. Thank you, Bruce, for that kind introduction. I understand there are other people that may be viewing this from afar, and so I'm, I'm with you in spirit from the podium here. Um, we were reminiscing last night that um, I think I was here last almost 20 years ago when the Graduate Hotel was the Radisson and there was snow on the ground then too. And um, I gave a talk on this esoteric subject called chimeric antigen receptor T cells. And here I'm back 20 years later talking about chimeric antigen receptor T cells. So for the younger folks, maybe it's a lesson in, in perseverance and persistence in science, uh, which can come in handy sometimes. So. Why don't I jump into this uh, presentation? Uh, just for disclosures, I am a co-founder of Juno Therapeutics and the product JCAR-17, which will be Juno's uh, globally um, uh, deployed CD19 product, was prototyped in my lab at Seattle Children's, and I have SRAs with uh, the company. So um, at the root of this talk is the concept of how we can marshal the power of uh, the immune system, the human immune system, and in particular, effector cells of the immune system is called T cells, which predominantly are protect, a protective mechanism for intracellular pathogens. And, and how can we mobilize that arm of the immune system to be an effective player in the immunotherapy of human cancer? And um, my lab is really. Um, uh, evolved over the last decade to be a lab that um, has about 50% of investigators being bioengineers and the rest of the 50% being a group of immunologists, molecular biologists, and cell biologists. And what the, um, the engineers bring to the laboratory is this real uh, conceptual rigor around um, engineering in the space of synthetic biology. How do we create parts and devices and modules, not in the computer science space, but in the cellular science space, 
where these genetic elements can be deployed as apps, if you will, in, in um, primary human T cells to carry out effector functions and programs that uh, make them uh, better able to recognize and kill cancer cells. And many of you know now, it's not a new story anymore, that one of the really first successful synthetic biology applications in the human system is this concept of taking uh, populations of T cells, which are otherwise functional, but maybe specific for viruses or fungi or other intracellular path pathogens, and um, expressing in them artificial receptors called chimeric antigen receptors, which have orthogonal structures to the way T cells naturally recognize antigen through antibody extracellular domains, so they can see native protein on their surface and have transmembrane proteins where we can stack in series signaling modules that um, give uh, signaling outputs to T cells that is that can be fundamentally different, sometimes in an advantageous uh, manner for the uh, therapeutic cell when it encounters cancer. And sometimes uh, we've learned the hard way that you can make chimeric receptors that have uh, distinct disadvantages for that cell. And if you combine these in a, in a engineered cell production system that's permissive for retaining key features of the T cells, so there's a lot of ways in that ex vivo time that you're, you're um, manipulating these cells to take a good cell and basically render it uh, therapeutically inert. Um, but if you have a permissive culture system um, and an immunoresponsive clinical context, then you could have disruptive therapeutic results as we've seen with CD19 malignancies. And here is just an example. The little cells are, are chimeric antigen receptor T cells, a car that I built uh, back in 1995, they see L1 cam on neuroblastoma cells, and you can see the interaction of the large adherent uh, neuroblastoma tumor cells with these chimeric T cells and their ability to uh, uh, basically eradicate cancer in a petri dish. And this therapy being very unusual, and that is a living therapy capable of amplifying inside the patient as you see the cells growing now in numbers in the petri dish. So in my 20 years in this field, I would say um, in 2019, um, if people tell you that the field is pretty much done, we've figured it out, even for leukemias and lymphomas, I would push back and say we're just getting started. So this is kind of software development, if you will, and we're in version 1.1. We have overcome some hurdles in terms of figuring out these second generation chimeric receptors that house either CD28 or 41BB as being um, really important in um, allowing these cells to persist and expand in vivo as composed of the first generation cars. And we're learning more about how what T cell populations we should be focusing on for their genetic modification. But having said that, we use vector systems that constitutively express chimeric antigen receptors at levels that we can't control pharmacologically. Um, a lot of the studies are transducing uh, bulk PBMC, so every product is different based on the repertoire of T cells in the patient's bloodstream at the time that they're A4E, so that has tremendous variability based on patient age, their prior therapies, uh, their disease status. So we have a lot of refinements to do to take it from kind of a, a really patient-specific therapeutic and how can we apply engineering strategies to make it more drug-like in terms of its uniformity and therefore predictable safety and efficacy outcomes. At Seattle Children's, our research program has built now 10 uh, clinical trials that are operated under INDs that we hold. So this all comes from our research uh, pipeline and R&D labs. We've dosed over 200 children and young adults and as uh, we'll cover today, I'm going to spend some time on our ALL um, pipeline. We have uh, five trials now that are operative, and I'll explain why five trials for one disease ALL. What's the rationale? Um, I'm going to um, discuss in a limited manner our solid tumor program, but focus more on what we're doing in pediatric brain tumors, which is once you uh, deal with leukemias, successfully, then brain tumors become the predominant tumor type that contribute to pediatric uh, morbidity and mortality. So let's get into this ALL space. And um, I suppose an ideal curative um, 
paradigm for any given patient is that when they're referred to the clinic uh, with refractory progressive leukemia and apheresis is performed and a product is manufactured and a relatively small dose of product can be infused into the patient and upon encounter of large amounts of antigen that are contributed by CD19 on both leukemic cells as well as normal B cell repertoires at the time, these cells undergo logarithmic expansion and reach a, a, a mass of CAR T cells that induces the collapse of the leukemic burden as well as the normal B cell burden. And ideally in this therapy, there is an area under the curve of sufficient time that the CAR T cells have the ability to stochastically find and encounter every last leukemic cell that may be in anatomic sites that are difficult for T cells to get to. So you need time uh, in order to eradicate every last leukemic cell. And upon doing that, at some point for patients, you want their normal B cells to come back um, because going around with a lifelong need for IVIG and not being able to respond to vaccines is not an ideal end state for the more and more patients that ideally we're going to be curing uh, in the years to come. So to give you a frame of reference for our system, we use uh, third generation self-enacting lentiviral vectors that uh, express our transgenes often a human elongation factor one promoter. And we utilize second generation chimeric antigen receptors that have 41 BB zeta. Our constructs have a ribosome skip sequence so we can um, express a second independent polypeptide. And this polypeptide is a human-based protein. It's a truncated form of the human epidermal growth factor receptor. Um, and this neither has the ligand binding domain nor the cytoplasmic tail, but retains the epitope for a pharmaceutical antibody called Herbitux. So we can use Herbitux to both track the cells, purify the cells, and maybe in vivo, when we want to suicide the cells, use Herbitux infusions to the patients to get rid of these CAR T cells. And you can see in the system, when you express a CAR, you get con coordinate expression of this EGFRT tag. We've taken a strategy in our Seattle program to make CAR T cell products of defined composition. And the first pass at this defined composition is to make products from purified CD8 cells and purified CD4 cells. So each patient has two products made, the purified 8s and 4s. And then we can infuse these cells at defined ratios. And most of our trials to date, we've just started with a one-to-one -one ratio. This is in contrast to uh, unmanipulated or unpurified products where in a single trial within 10, 10 patients, you could have one patient getting 90% CD8 cells and 10% CD4s, and another patient, just based on their apheresis product, having inverse ratio. So we're trying to normalize uh, that component. We also purify the CAR T cells for uniform levels and frequencies of CAR expression through this EGFRT tag. And the way we do this is we take the apheresis products, we positively select immunomagnetically for CD4 and CD8 cells. These cells are stemmed on beads that have anti-CD3 and anti-CD28. We transduce and then we come back mid-process back to the Clinimax machine and we use an Herbitux biotin and antibiotin microbeads to purify the CAR cells. So we have uh, um, very pure populations of CAR positive, either CD4 and CD8 cells. And you can see in our manufacturing process here, this is the extent to which uh, the CD4 products are pure for CD4 and CD8. And you could see the CAR expression, all the cells are CAR positive and they tend to have MFIs that are fairly um, tightly clustered. So the, the cell product has predictable potency uh, with respect to the CAR mediated effector functions. One big step, I think when I was here last, I was telling Bruce how we grow billions of cells and we, we were cloning them at that time and it would take eight weeks and maybe four stimulations and little did we know in the early 2000s that we were basically terminally differentiating our T cells ex vivo and they tend to have a half-life upon reinfusion of 72 um, hours or so. So we by terminal differentiation and ex excessive stimulation and expansion, you basically program those now fully differentiated effector cells to um, um, not be able to survive upon adoptive transfer. Now we do exactly the opposite. We try to have cells in a minimal culture time. We try to minimally activate them and we keep them in uh, homeostatic cytokine cocktails 
uh, in order to prevent their differentiation into effector cells. So if these are the incoming um, PBMC CD8 cells for IL-7 receptor alpha, we actually increase and enrich for IL-7 receptor alpha cells. The same is true for CCR7, CD27. So these are all markers that are associated with the uh, proficiency of a cell to, to be able to persist and proliferate um, upon adoptive transfer. So we took this manufacturing strategy, we brought it into a, a phase one, two uh, clinical trial that Rebecca Gardner uh, leads at Seattle Children's Hospital. We manufacture ourselves in a GMP facility that we built um, at the Research Institute at Seattle Children's Research um, um, Program. And in that trial, we found that um, we could make products successfully, even though this, this procedure was more complicated technically to manufacture cells, 96% of enrolled patients had a product that was released for them. And, um, and the reason we think that's true is that those purification steps actually facilitate uh, cultures that expand. So we're removing monocytes that are highly um, um, uh, suppressive to proliferation, we're removing, we're removing residual leukemic cells. And so um, this process has been uh, very rigorous in very end-stage patients. And overall, on intent to treat, we had about a 90% MRD negative remission rate, and when we got to the maximal tolerated dose of a million cells per kilo with the flu side conditioning, this was uh, a uniform 14 out of 14 MRD negative remissions. We've now taken our trial and we're, we're exporting products, so we make them in Seattle from apheresis products that get shipped to us from other children's hospitals, and we're shipping back frozen products, and in our multi-site trial, and we're over 100 patients now, we, have a, we continue to have a 96% uh, success rate in manufacturing, and we've re retained our intent to treat MRD negative re remission at above 85% in this multi-center, um, uh, much more complicated um, uh, clinical trial scenario. So I think we're doing pretty well, uh, but I think there's a lot more to do to make this better. So um, I think the priorities now are enforcing prolonged functional engraftment. I'm going to show you data why that's important. Preventing antigen escape um, as an as a etiology of treatment failure. Reversing the B cell aplasia and then uh, just in terms of scale out, manufacturing better, faster, and cheaper. And I, I want to touch on these topics. So what does it look like in terms of remission durability? We get remissions in almost all patients, but what counts now is the dur durability of those remissions. It, it definitely parses out into, for those patients that in remission get a hemo, uh, uh, um, hemopoietic stem cell transplantation, there's a nice uh, plateau that's developing around 75, uh, at 75% with a um, uh, mean follow-up of greater than 26 months, but there are patients that are not candidates for consolidative transplant, and they do much worse. So without a transplant, this is the fall-off in terms of leukemia-free survival. How do we understand how to m make the prognosis for those patients better? Um, and so you can see again here, this is the impact of getting a transplant. If you've had no prior transplant, it's your first transplant in CAR T cell remission, you're about 90% um, leukemia-free survival, uh, again, at 26 months. If you can't have a transplant, and that's usually because patients have other medical issues that prevent them from being safe transplant candidates, um, the prognosis is not so good. If you're getting a second or third transplant after CAR remission, the impact of transplant basically goes away. These patients uh, likely have biologically much more aggressive disease and another transplant um, doesn't have an impact on the durability of their remission. We also um, have been aggressive about treating infants. There, earlier on, people said you can't make products from infants. Um, and we wanted to uh, be inclusive of these, uh, this patient population that tend to have very aggressive leukemia. And their um, leukemia-free survival uh, with CAR T-cell therapy and their remission rates are uh, much the same as older children. So infants can be put into remission, and for many of those infants, the remissions can be durable. So the question now, I think, is, is CAR T-cell therapy, CD19 therapy, in this scenario for pediatric leukemia, is it simply a bridge to transplant, or can we further iterate and technologically advance this therapy to be a curative therapeutic that maybe um, obviate the need for transplant and or uh, uh, prolonged chemo 
therapy in patients. So for the patients that don't have a transplant, they're not a, hom they're not a homogenous group in terms of their outcomes. And we actually find that we have three cohorts of outcomes. And those cohorts of outcomes are dependent on the duration of B-cell aplasia, how long the CAR T-cells are engrafted in the patients after remission is induced. And you can see the protective effect of having at least six months of B-cell aplasia and the poor prognosis of patients for having CD19 positive relapse um, if they have um, less than 63 days of B-cell aplasia in an intermediate group that gets between 63 and six months. So there's a hierarchy of uh, durability of remissions that, are, that relate to the risk of CD19 positive relapse. Obviously, I'm not going to count, and I'm going to tell you about CD19 negative relapse, but this is a monotherapy specific for CD19, so it's, I think it's fair to, to look through the lens of CD19 positive relapse. Well, how do we figure out what the drivers are for duration of B-cell aplasia? And we have some strong signal that actually it's the amount of CD19 antigen that the patient has in their body at the time of adoptive transfer that drives the proliferation of these CAR T cells and that max amplitude kind of sets a, a uh, area under the curve slope for um, T cell, uh, CAR T cell persistence. And you see that antigen, uh, the highest antigen patients more than 15% um, in their bloodstream of um, CD19 antigen, I'm sorry, in the bone marrow at the time of adoptive transfer have the highest um, areas under the curve for CAR T cell persistence. And if you have less than 5% um, uh, of B cells in the marrow, normal or leukemic, you have very attenuated proliferation. So the amount of antigen drives the CAR T cells that sets the kind of the clock for how long the B cells will last. And the lowest uh, amount of antigen um, really puts patients at very high risk for CD19 relapse. This, of course, is really important because the field is starting to ask, well, can we use CAR T cells in first remission uh, for very high-risk disease when patients are in an MRD-negative remission, so there's very few malignant B cells, and that induction therapy can reduce the number of B cells. So are we setting ourselves up for failure because we're going to be infusing patients with very low uh, B cell counts? So you see here the difference in um, the impact of uh, B cell aplasia. If you have high B cell aplasia, a high uh, long duration B cell aplasia because you have high antigen, without a bone marrow transplant, you're at about 65% of patients are continue to be in remission on an average of 26 months out. If you have high antigen and low B cell aplasia, that's a very, uh, that's a very poor risk group. Um, low antigen, it really doesn't parse out. Everyone has a poor prognosis. So if you do the math and you look at uh, the risk of relapse, whether it, uh, whether it be CD19 positive or CD19 negative, um, if you're high antigen and long B cell aplasia, you have about almost a 90% leukemia-free survival at 26 months when you look just at CD19 positive relapses. So that is a scenario that competes well with having a consolidative allotransplant. But how do we make more patients have those attributes to the therapy to uh, uh, give them the chance for this, um, this therapeutic outcome? So you see here, if you um, are a patient that has high antigen and short B-cell aplasia and get a transplant, you can be salvaged with that transplant. So we asked the question, if you have low amounts of antigen, can we replace that antigen with an engineered vaccine for CAR T cells, essentially. And now CAR, CAR T cells, as you know, see native CD19 on the surface, so it won't be like a peptide or a viral vaccine. It needs, the vaccine needs to express CD19 uh, protein. And so we hypothesize that we can make CAR T cell vaccines by making T cells express CD19. So we call, call these T cell antigen presenting cells. We uh, designed a truncated CD19 that expresses the full extracellular domain, including the CAR epitope loop. We can transduce uh, with uh, syn lentivirus, and we can make T cells look like B cells with respect to CD19 antigen. They grow um, like their counterparts. And activated T cells have co-stimulatory ligands that make them very immunostimulatory for CD19 CAR T cells. So this is the proliferation burst uh, that a TAPC delivers versus uh, LCL and K562 that express CD19. So T cells are very good immunostimulatory cells. 
And in this macaque study, uh, we did an experiment. Uh, the CD19 car doesn't work in macaques. It doesn't cross-react, but the CD20 car does. And you can see in this animal uh, that has declining CAR T cell persistence, if we give a dose of TAPCs, you get a tenfold increase in the frequency of CAR T cells in the blood and another area under the curve. And this uh, is without side effects. So we went forward to develop this for patients, and we developed our PLAT3 trial. In this trial, patients get their CAR T cells made, and in the leftover cells from the CAR production, we make their TAPC and we freeze them into multiple vials. And the concept is if we can give uh, monthly TAPC doses to patients at high risk for losing B cell aplasia, we can, we can increase the number of kids that have at least six months of B cell aplasia and reduce uh, the incidence of CD19 um, positive relapse. Here's an example of a human being getting this therapy. So uh, the open triangle is the CAR T-cell dose, and this is a patient that has low antigen burden, so it has very few B-cells, and you see this very attenuated uh, blip of CAR T-cells in blue. In green is the tracking of the TAPCs, because we can measure them in the blood too. So when we give a TAPC dose, we see a burst of these cells in, in the blood, and then you see a burst of the CAR T-cells, and it wasn't uniform uh, throughout all the TAPC dosing, uh, probably based on some sampling issues. But you can see as you get out to the third and fourth doses, now you have expansions of the CAR T cells in response to the TAPCs that is significantly larger in magnitude than the initial proliferation when the cells went in and saw leukemia and residual B cells. These TAPC doses are administered in the outpatient clinic uh, without side effect. They're, they're very safe. So the data is early, but this is the uh, Kaplan-Meier curve for six months of B-cell aplasia. And you can see in the matched cohort that they have a uh, very um, uh, poor prognosis for prolonged B-cell aplasia. And already we're seeing a really big difference in patients that um, have the same prognostic uh, uh, attributes that get the TAPCs. So we may be on to, um, uh, onto some positive data uh, in terms of um, decreasing ALL relapse, but time will tell. Um, another reason for short um, persistence in some patients is that they reject their CAR product. Our, um, our PLAT2 product uses a murine SCFE binder for the CAR, so it's mouse sequence. And here's an example of our PLAT6 trial that's now enrolling, a phase one, two trial, in which the SCFE binder is a completely human antibody from a library selection. And so this is an example of a patient that got Kimraya, the clinical drug that has the murine binder, and had a loss of B cell aplasia and a CD19 positive relapse. The patient came to Seattle and they got our PLAT2 product that has the mouse binder and there's absolutely no engraftment. This uh, is suggestive that there is an immune rejection response. There was no effect on the leukemic cells. That patient then got a third CAR product, got our human CAR product, had a nice T cell engraftment and went into an MRD negative remission. So this is, shows you that the humanized product can potentially rescue patients that have had previous murine products that have rejected and maybe in the future as we as the field moves to human uh, binders we'll have less patients um, have rejection responses and more patients um, not having that untoward outcome. So um, those were the two primary areas that we focused on initially to deal with CD19 positive relapse but as we push that envelope forward and have less more, more selective pressure, we see more of our relapses now are CD19 negative than they're CD19 positive. And uh, my friend Terry Fry has really mapped out um, the etiology of that. Some of it is splice variation where the epitope is spliced out of 19 and the 19 is there as a truncated molecule on the leukemic cells. We have some patients also that come back with lineage switch um, towards myeloid uh, relapses when they have this MLL um, leukemia um, uh, feature. So um, our approach to decreasing the risk of antigen escape is, of course, to multiplex the specificities of the CAR T cells. Um, here you see um, that um, what I was talking about in terms of the risk of um, CD19 negative relapse, it inverts and is twice as common in our patients now. And so 
Uh, we wanted to start um, generating products that had more than one specificity. We focused on CD22 as being a second specificity. And there's a number of ways from an engineering perspective you can make bispecific CAR T cells. You can make two products and release two products and then infuse two products, which is a, a fair, fairly labor intensive and expensive. You can make single products in which each cell has two independent cars and you can make single cars that have two binding domains. This can be very tricky because every car needs a certain spacer length or biophysical gap of where the epitope is on the tumor and where the car T cell binds to have um, optimal signaling. So we took a version or a, 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 a little bit of a different approach to this adding approach. What we did is we made two vectors and we used two vectors to, and we used them simultaneously in the transduction of the T cells. And we made a second barcode for our uh, system. So now the CD19 car has a truncated HER2 that is recognized with uh, cetuximab and the 22 car has the EGFRT tag. And you can see when you use one vector or the other, you can see uh, their respective tags being expressed. And when you co-transduce and co-purify, you get cells that express both tags and both chimeric antigen receptors. And so now we make products in which uh, the product is a mixture of fours and eights of defined ratio. And there's actually four elements to this product. Uh, the product has some cells, a minority of cells that don't have either car. And then they're equally distributed to have either one car or the other or both cars. And this is the product that goes into patients and they can be independently tracked. So it's kind of a competitive engraftment experiment in a human being uh, because uh, we do have data that the 22 car has the ability to aggregate um, and that aggregation can in induce um, adverse effects on the physiology of those T cells. And indeed in our first seven patients treated on this trial, the 19 car um, is the winner for the competitive engraftment. It um, is present in about 90% of the car T cells after a month. Um, and the presence of the 22 car um, is adverse both for the 22 alone cars, but it also drags down the engraftment potency of the bispecific cars. So this is a warning that if you want to multiplex cars that uh, in terms of the T cell fitness of, of the car T cell, it's, it, it's more that a bad car drags down the whole uh, process rather than an optimal car can compensate for bad cars. We're getting into the real nerdy um, um, side effects of uh, CAR T cell engineering. But these products can have nice um, ex vivo potency for both 19 and 22, and we're going to try to resolve this by making another 22 CAR that doesn't have this um, aggregation ten tendency. So I'm going to finish up with this part of the talk, and just where we're headed is um, a, a next generation system in which we have uh, products that are multi specific. For the leukemia, we have TAPCs that can keep those cells around, and we may have an induction dose that's small to mitigate the toxicities of engraftment and then come back with a consolidation large dose of CAR T cells when there is an antigen, which would be uh, considerably safer, and then drive with TAPCs. What I won't show you is the cetuximab ablation. We have only one patient now uh, that we've been able to study, uh, but we saw that within a week of cetuximab, we saw CD19 cells emerge uh, in the bone marrow for the first time in two years in a patient, uh, but we haven't treated many patients, so I don't know the robustness of this suicide strategy to date. So I'm going to pivot now uh, in the next section of my talk uh, to go from this story in leukemia to solid tumors. Um, and I hope the young people in this room are convinced that there's possibilities to have meaningful therapeutics develop in this CAR T cell space for solid tumors, but it's going to take some time to really figure out um, how to make that work. And it, 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 it's perhaps self-evident, but a CD19 specific T cell infused intravascularly into a, a vascular tumor like leukemia that expresses CD19 where the T cells and leukemic cells naturally home uh, in which the B lymphocytes have immunostimulatory behavior is a very different kettle of fish of infused, rather than infusing into a solid tumor patient where the only antigen for propagating the cells and activating the cells may be within these very uh, immunosuppressive tumor microenvironments that are organized th through their stroma and other uh, effects to really uh, limit the uh, bioactivity of these cells. So we need to overcome that. 
One of the first strategies that we're taking to, to look at that is in our brain tumor program where we're giving CAR T cells directly into the central nervous system via catheters. So if it's a, um, a tumor that is a, a local tumor, the catheter tip will be placed in the resection bed. If it's a metastatic cancer, uh, such as medulloblastoma or pendymomas, the T cells are infused into the ventricular system via an OMIA catheter. We've been interested in, in this for a long time and comes from data that um, we evaluated human T cell tropism to gliomas and we found that gliomas and other brain tumors actually produce chemokines that enforce their tumor biology, but for ex vivo expanded T cells, the CCL2 uh, chemokine in particular that's made by, frequently by brain tumors is highly chemotactic for human T cells. So here the firefly luciferase is in the CAR T cell. Um, and the tumor uh, is in uh, the animal's right flank. We designed a prototype car that's called a zetakine. Uh, this is a chimeric receptor that's a little bit different from antibody-based targeting and uses the human uh, cytokine IL-13 as the um, targeting domain to recognize and bind to cells that express the IL-13 receptor. And in the context of the central nervous system, the IL-13 receptor alpha-2 is unique for tumor cells and not present in the human uh, uh, nervous system. And here you, we uh, show that if the animal has two tumors, one in the left and right hemisphere, if we dose in the right hemisphere, the cells are retained there until the tumor is eradicated, and then they move to the contralateral hemisphere, and on IHC, they move right through the corpus callosum in the gray matter tracks to get to tumor in the contralateral hemisphere, and this is associated with uh, regressions of glioma. So we started these trials now um, over a decade ago um, in glioblastoma patients with recurrent disease, and we dose cells, um, we gave patients multiple doses, in hindsight, we rationalized that as a way of fractionate, fractionating the CAR T cell dose rather than giving one large dose and trying to deal with the neuroinflammatory consequences of that dose. We were giving doses on a weekly basis. In retrospect, that might we were maybe uh, um, were lucky in that um, we appreciated this point that. Um, in solid tumor microenvironments, at least, with antigen that's not rapidly cleared, T cells undergo this programmatic change uh, called exhaustion. And that exhaustion transition uh, occurs between about seven to 10 days in the, in the presence of uh, persistent antigen. So by dosing cells repetitively, we're actually recharging uh, the tumor uh, bed with functional CAR T cells. And we saw uh, some nice radiographic regressions um, and imaging studies that suggested we were seeing bioactivity. Uh, the team at City of Hope also published uh, a, a patient that had multifocal glioblastoma with METs to the spine and multiple um, uh, foci of disease in the central nervous system that had a complete regression of all foci, both in the brain as well as in the spine and prolonged um, survival of this patient, suggesting that even for a glioblastoma multiforma, which is one of the uh, purportedly more immunosuppressive uh, tumor types that CAR T cells can have uh, some biological activity. The consequence, though, um, as you can imagine, uh, is that we saw in these patients that it had regressions that upon recurrence, uh, uh, they had loss of IL-13 receptor alpha-2 expression, uh, both in primary tumors and, and also in all the METs. So this is going to be uh, a problem in solid tumors that is going to be an order of magnitude more difficult than in our ALL. So we, we need to figure out how to overcome tumor heterogeneity that likely pre-exists our therapy and then gets exacerbated by the pressure of immunotherapy. One approach is to have multiple targets, and so we have a number of trials that um, are ongoing in our brain tumor trial program. And the idea is not to use these singly, uh, but to test and show that they're individually safe and then to be able to collect them and make products with more and more uh, tumor specificities over time. You know, the ideal state conceptually and, you know, where we are today is we use one target and we basically push the tumor into heterogeneity. And if you can create a group of targets that um, by design create a synthetic lethality to the tumor, you basically hem the tumor in by not being able to simultaneously um, escape from all the targets at once. So we can make multi 
uh, specific products by co-transduction. And here, you know, when we use one vector, you get one antigen targeting capability. If you use two, you get two. It's very digital, three, three, and with all four antigens in this uh, cytotoxicity heat map, you get all antigens. And we showed that you can make, um, through CRISPR technology, you can make escape variants and co-engraft them. And um, if um, at least one specificity out of a fourplex car product is present, you'll, you'll uh, eliminate all of the tumor, uh, the antigen negative uh, variants. So that's where we're heading. We're probably moving this technology into a non-viral uh, gene transfer system because this, uh, with all these vectors, it gets very expensive. And so we've been working with uh, the piggyback transposase. And I know um, your program is a, a rich legacy in, in Sleeping Beauty. Um, and we're now using mRNA for the transposase uh, and nanoplasmid vectors for um, the payloads. I'm going to end now probably with uh, maybe the weirdest uh, part of this. This is new data that I'm going to share with you and have at it. Um, but the concept is, um, can we really trust tumors and their transcriptional fidelity in immunotherapy targeting, even if we had five, ten different epitopes? And is there potentially the ability to overcome this by chemically labeling the membranes of tumor cells through a drug? in which we can come in now with a chemical-specific CAR T-cell product. So uh, what I'm going to talk to you about is the technology we're developing to chemically tag tumor plasma membranes that exploits fundamental and inescapable biophysical and tumor microenvironment features of all um, solid tumors. So conceptually, if we can label now uh, the surface of tumor cells with a chemical structure that exposes an epitope, a chemical epitope, we can come in with a chemical tag-specific CAR T-cell and target that tumor. And so we've been interested in a, in a class of small molecules that can be synthesized that look like phospholipids. So they're phospholipid mimetics. Uh, they're very lipophilic and upon systemic administration intercalate into the plasma membrane of tumor cells. They can be tuned in their alkyl chain to have very long dwell times in the membranes of tumor cells and very short half-lives in non-malignant cells based on uh, the tumor's um, uh, um, metabolism related to phospholipid membrane retention and generation. And then we can design extracellular projections from these molecules to stick a chemical out into the extracellular space. And finally, I'll tell you that we can make pro-drug versions of these that don't present that chemical unless uh, there's a, a tumor microenvironment chemical reaction that unmasks uh, the epitope. So this is chemistry that goes back to the 1990s, I think originally at University of Michigan and then in Madison, Wisconsin, where, where chemists were creating alkyl phosphocholine analogs. They're called phospholipid ethers. And they basically have a choline domain and then an alkyl chain. And if you tune the alkyl chain to about 18 carbons, you get this phenomenon of long half-life in tumor cells and short half-lives in normal cells. And they show both in rodent models and human models that they can load this these um, molecules into tumor membranes um, across disease indications. They focus, the field is focused on the alkyl tail being the payload for radio uh, uh, isotopes, for radiation therapy, or for optical imaging. And that puts the payload within the membrane. And so I, I, we focused on taking these and creating a new class of alkyl phosphocholine analogs that stick a chemical uh, moiety out from the surface. And so this is James in the lab who's a chemical engineer, and he created now variants that put peg spacers off the choline and put our tag molecule fluorescine into the extracellular space. Uh, this is uh, synthetic chemistry, and, and James can make kilograms, and uh, this material is, uh, is green and can be traced very easily. So when you give this as an IV infusion, it's very non-toxic, and it goes into all cells. It preferentially quantitatively loads higher into tumor cells, but certainly it goes into all cells. But if you wait, and now this is 48 hours after the IV infusion, and you look at a brain tumor graft in a mouse, so the glioblastoma is in the brain and the tumor tag was infused IV, and you look at the contralateral hemisphere for the amount of retained fluorescein versus the fluorescein content on the, on the membranes of the tumor cells, you see now a, a differential amount. And this is about a tenfold differential. 
We made CAR T cells that are fluorescein specific. We made 35 different variants with binders over three uh, orders of magnitude of affinity. And, and as is typical for CAR T cells, the winner in terms of cytolytic potency and cytokine production was not the highest affinity. It was in between and it required a certain spacer domain. So I humbly tell you, we're still very empiric in terms of design principles for chimeric antigen receptors. Um, I'll just point out that there's one attribute to the system, which is convenient, and is that there's an FDA-approved drug, which is free fluorescein. Uh, it's used in angiography of retina and other applications. And if you give free fluorescein into the in vitro activation system, you completely shut down CAR activation. Presumably, the free fluorescein is occupying all the SCFE uh, sites, and they can't interact with the membrane of tumor cells at that point. So when we give this, so this is a scenario where we give the FLPLE IV and we give T cells right away. And this is a toxicity graph. It's, it's hard to read, but essentially uh, you have a massive activation syndrome and the majority of mice die. And you can give free fluorescein and you can rescue a couple mice. And those mice um, have complete tumor regressions and, um, and durable uh, complete regressions. But it's a highly toxic system, even with giving one dose of free fluorescein. This is another system where we give the, uh, the alkylphosphocholine fluorescein molecule directly into the tumor bed. You still get some cytokine release syndrome, but it's more moderate. And 100% of the mice have complete durable regression of this tumor, which is a triple negative breast cancer in the flank. But that's not a very tenable clinical pathway to be just trying to inject uh, stereotactically this drug into tumor beds. And as I alluded to before, fluorescein is a very planar molecule, and these SCFVs have very tight binding pockets. So we hypothesize is if we append, append a steric additional chemical moiety, we can basically block the ability of fluorescein to bind in the pocket. And we, uh, we decided to utilize a reactive oxygen species cleavable linker to that moiety. So now in a high ROS environment, uh, you get cleavage. And upon cleavage, uh, the fluorescein is, is, um, becomes fluorescent again. And here you see when we load tumor cells uh, ex vivo with the parent drug, FLPLE, they, they are fluorescent. The pro drug goes down uh, towards um, the negative control cell line. And if we stress the cells to make ROS in a low um, serum environment, that endogenous ROS cleaves uh, the steric hindrance molecule and, those, and the cells then become fluorescent. So chemically, this appears to be working as designed on the surface of a loaded tumor cell. Here's the, um, here is the data in terms of uh, activation. It's probably most clear here. So if tumor targets are loaded with the pro-drug um, and they're uh, co-cultured with uh, anti-fluorescein CAR T cells, there's no activation for cytokine production. If you put those tumor cells in the low serum condition, then uh, there's cleavage and the T cells start activating nearly to levels uh, that are as high as the non-mass pro-drug. That's also seen with other activation markers, such as upregulation of 41BB and, and uh, LAG3. So here's the experimental model that um, is intriguing to us. What we see now, we give the CAR T cells, and then we can IV dose the pro-FLPLE. Mice uh, develop grade 1 toxicities that are there um, as the tumor is regressing. So there's kind of a cytokine storm for the solid tumor. Uh, the black line are control mice that get CAR T cells without the pro drug, and they, um, um, they, the tumors grow and to lethality. And here's the regression of these tumors when they're given this pro FLPLE twice a week. And we have a lot to learn about the pharmacokinetics and pharmacodynamics, but um, this model uh, is very w well tolerated by the animals and has a nice potency readout. So I just wanted to share this story with you, which is another iteration of kind of synthetic biology now merging with chemical engineering to maybe overcome some of what appear to be really daunting problems in the field, particularly as we uh, look at solid tumor therapy. The very last um, slide I will show you because I want time to answer questions is how do you go from an academic shop um, where you do proof of concept to try to scale out so you can really move these therapies into phase two trials and multi-site phase two trials as we have done. Most car production 
in academia at least still is kind of this notion of the Bugatti factory where everyone comes to the product. Um, and so this creates um, a bottleneck in terms of throughput where you may want more of an assembly line production uh, strategy to play out. And this is a large part by having small rooms, little GMP rooms with two incubators and you can do you know, just a small number of products per room and you only have so many of these rooms. Um, at Seattle Children's, we're, we're uh, just completing a new facility. Um, it's a 30,000 square foot GMP, but what's important about this is we've now uh, assembled and designed ballrooms for this kind of uh, um, assembly line car T-cell production. So they have six workstations. These aren't hoods, they're bench workstations. And then they're interspersed with incubation farm rooms that could house hundreds of products at a time. And so this allows us to go from where we are today, where we're making about 200 products a year to easily be over 1,000 to 2,000 products based on this assembly line. That was made possible and it was FDA authorized because we were able to do engineering on the process itself to basically create a closed system process in which you never open a vial or a cap or a flask. So uh, with that, then you can, op you can work in open workstations and you can configure the workstation for the workflow of the 100 products that you're going to manipulate in that day, for instance. Um, so this is now coming online and it'll, it will take us about eight months to validate um, the facility and the program, but will come on um, uh, by the end of this year. So with that, I want to leave time for questions. Thank you very much for your time and attention. I know people in this room have been very gracious. If you're in the other room and you've already left, that's too bad for me or you're, you're on your phone. Um, and this has really been a, a, a real um, uh, evolution of getting different groups in, in our academic environment to work together. So the basic scientists starting to work with engineers and process scientists. We brought in a, a coordination center that does our regulatory affairs, our clinical data. The, the clinicians come and are part of this uh, environment on a daily basis. They're not off in another building. Um, and the correlative studies lab that brings data from the patients goes all the way back to the basic scientists in real time. And that's really created a dynamic environment. So I'd like to thank the, the funding uh, uh, the funders of this work, and especially our patients um, and their families for, um, for participating in our trials. And with that, I thank you for your time and attention. Questions, comments? I really enjoyed the talk. So just a couple of questions. So in the first part of your talk, I was just wondering what are the co-stimulatory molecules that are present on these TAPCs that actually results in such a good priming? And secondly, towards the later part of your talk, when you mentioned you talked about the pro-drug and act, it's Ross-mediated activation, I was wondering whether the, in in you know mice that may be more exposed to pathogens or humans, whether you know macrophages that you know produce ROS actively yeah. could result in non-specific activation and toxicities. Yeah, uh, two very good questions. So um, we do have our our, um, our single cell RNA seq on T cells in different stages of their activation, but just grossly by flow, they they upregulate several ligands, uh, B7, one B7, two. Uh, uh, for sure, for CD28 engagement. Um, I'd have to go back and look at whether they express um, 41BB ligand. Do you know that, Bruce, if an activated T I I don't know. So, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, the second question, so I very much appreciate that comment around Ross as a linker. And what gives me, um, that was a real proof of concept, but um, there are about, when you talk to the chemical engineers, they, well, we have eight or nine different types of linkers, protease sensitive, pH sensitive, hypoxia sensitive, uh, um, re reducing um, uh, reduction sensitive. So there's a whole platform. And where I think this is going is that we're going to take a molecule like fluorescein and you can actually append more than one steric hindrance molecules. So you can start creating logic gates for these steric hindering decoupling so you can make it ROS plus hypoxia, low pH plus uh, protease activity. And that's where I think we're going to probably 
um, evolve the chemistry to the point of it's specific enough for the tumor. That makes sense. Yeah. Thanks. Okay, sorry. sorry about that in the other room. So just to follow up on that, the chemical modification question, and I, I'm not sure, I, well, I think you said it, I don't want to try to track it. The sequence is you get CAR T cells first and then the prodrug? So, or yeah, yeah. What about the other direction? We've done it a couple ways. In the, in the experiment where we wanted to see what the worst toxicities look like, we gave uh, the non pro drug version and then we gave the T cells within 24 hours, and that's where mice were just having um, autotoxicus fulminans, is the old is the old term for it. got this massive activation syndrome, cytokine storm, and, and rapid death. Um, in the when we give the prodrug, we found that we can also give a priming dose of the prodrug before the CAR T cells, very little um, toxicity, and, and then you can give repeated doses of the prodrug even though the CAR T cells are in the animal and get tumor regressions without um, toxicity. Okay. So j just in that scenario where you give the prodrug first, have you looked at radiation as a way to activate ROS and tumors? We have, and I think... Um, Maybe as a technology, this, there are so many uh, possibilities to build on the kind of the chemical engineering and the, and the ways in which those molecules can be manipulated in vivo with, with um, approaches as you suggest. Yeah, yeah. Mike, that was a really great talk. Uh, trying to conceptualize the T cell seeing uh, fluorescein and others in a solid tumor. So one of the issues has been the migratory ability of T cells to get into the solid tumor to actually see some of the label or uh, in the immunosuppressive environment when they're there, both metabolic and cytokine. So how would these, T these CAR T cells overcome those uh, challenges? Yeah, I think those are fundamental to any strategy. Um, you know, the, the field is making some progress. Oxyplatin, for instance, as one of your lymphodepleting drugs can profoundly enhance um, uh, infiltration in T cells in, in models like the, the PANK model that are pretty inaccessible, uh, potential radiation, um, other strategies. We're, we're looking at polymers that can um, that polymerize in when thrombin is active, which is a very common, tumors are full of fibrin and laid down fibrin. So there's maybe ways in which we can create tags that are uh, vascular in nature and, and set up activation first outside of the tumor to get cells ready to go in and then in the tumor. But And the, the second question I had was on the transplant part is the bridge strategy. Mm -hmm. Why do you think the transplant works better in maintaining the remissions after a CAR T cell? Um, you know, you're the tra you're the transplanter. You have to help me with that. I mean, is it is it simply a matter of you know being having an MRD state in which the the allo effect of transplant for ALL, which is not so robust, actually can sterilize a patient. Um, you think if you gave another CAR T cell, you wouldn't have enough antigen to have that response, but with the allo antigen, whatever few cells are there could get eliminated. That's just the empiric interpretation of the data I would have. I guess, you know, the question would be, um, would it be best now um, to basically do the allo transplant to consolidate, and then once that patient has uh, weaned off of GVH meds without active GVH, make another product for the patient and consolidate again with a, the, the donor-derived product that comes from the patient. We've, we've made a lot of products, and maybe you have the same ex experience of they come, their donor-derived products that come from the apheresis of the patient at some point after allo transplant. And I think of around uh, greater than 50 patients in which we made the product of those types, we've had one recrudescence of mild skin GVH, but no other GVH complications. Yeah, yeah. Are there other questions? And just as a sort of a technical question, when you looked at the, the, when the mouse in the last part, when you did the mouse and you looked at the cytokine activation levels, <clears throat> is that a mouse model or is, and is that a mouse CAR-T or is that an NSG 
uh, tumor. At this stage, it's an NSG. NSG. Yeah. And so you see, okay, so you so when you get the CAR T activation, you see cytokine. You actually see in the mouse actually human toxicities. Cytokines. Yeah, that, and toxicities from the human cytokines. Yeah. Okay. Um, uh, thank. I, the other question I had was with regard to the the chemical. How pen, you know it's not that chemicals don't. There's a penetratability too in the tumor. I mean, otherwise we'd have solved this. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. You know, with a drug. So the question is, how penetrable is that drug into a solid tumor that has, you know, pretty uh, a, a pretty large pressure within it, you know, yeah. pushing out. Yeah. So have you looked at how penetrable the t these T cells can actually get in, based on, and is it better or worse than if you had a if you have a you know a protein based target? You yeah. Know, that would well, I would there. predict this this small molecule would be preferential. The the data that pre exists our work with that base module of the alkyl phosphocholine, um, both in the academic studies as well as um, a company called Selectar out of Madison is trying to commercialize this drug Moedi with the uh, with the radiation deliverable on the alkyl tail. They have looked at you know 80 xenografts models. Of tumors of different sizes, anatomic locations, and it's it's a it's a highly universal uptake of this uh, lipid mimetic into the membranes. So, um, at least when we look very closely at tumors of different sizes, small and larger, and we ask the pathologist to find a tumor cell without the fluorescein tag, that that we get the answer back that it's uniform. Just as a follow-up, how how um, just as a follow-up, do you actually know how much how much an you know, uh, engineered antigen you have to have one to get yeah. access? Yeah, no, we're we're doing we're making radio labeled versions of this, um, and we're working with a, a really a wonderful medicinal chemist at Purdue named Phil Lau, um, who's done versions of this, and he says so. We get nervous in the CAR T cell field that there's maybe less than ten thousand epitopes per cell in terms of activation. And these types of molecules load in the hundreds of thousands to millions of molecules per membrane. So the, the scarcity of epitope is so far on the other end of the curve. Yeah. Great. All right. Thank you very much. Thank you. Great